world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Hello and a very, very warm welcome to you. I'm very excited to be here in my very own kitchen um, to introduce to you the most wonderful person, this most wonderful human being, Joy Harjo. She's um, so inspiring and she's the, the National Poet of America, the American Poet Laureate. She's written eight collection of poetry books. She's written a memoir. She's received numerous awards for her work and her work deals with subjects that we should all um, be interested in and that we all are interested in in the form of family, exile, belonging, song. She's multi-talented because she's a saxophonist, a musician, as well as, uh, and as well as experimenting and playing around and enjoying herself with all sorts of different forms. Her work sings in multiple voices. It's really a huge uh, honour and a privilege uh, to be meeting her in the Zoom room. It's frustrating because I would love to have met her in person. My name's Jackie Kay. I'm the National Poet of Scotland, the macker. Um, I love the term macker. I love the democracy of the term because it comes nearest English equivalent to the word is maker. And uh, I love there is a Scottish expression that kind of goes, what do you make of that? Well, what do you make of me being your macker? But anyway, I love, uh, I, love, I love the word macker. When I first became macker, they asked me if I wanted to change the word because nobody knew what it meant. And I didn't, uh, I didn't so I made it my business really to try and uh, get people to know what the word means. We'll be talking about language, ancestry, passing things down, generation, song, exile, our mothers, our families, our secrets, our births, our deaths, the way that we hang on to people and the way that life continues. We'll be talking about all of these things and more as very much as we can fit in to this glorious hour. We're probably going to make it up an hour. We'll probably run for the hour because I think we might run out of time. So in the Zoom room with me, as it were, 
is Joy Harjo, and very next to her is the wonderful singer, uh, Black Scottish, like me, we're sisters under the skin, Black Scottish jazz musician, singer, uh, Suzanne Bonner. She's been with me, joining me every week uh, on Macker to Macker, our very own programme, and it's been a huge, huge success. Um, we did the last Macker to Macker last week, hopefully many of you will have seen it, and, um, and it's been an extraordinary pleasure working with Suzanne. Um, she takes everything seriously and she listens and she learns. Anyway, I'm just going to kick off, Joy, by saying welcome to our virtual Edinburgh. Welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Joy Harjo! Well, I am so glad to be here virtually. I wish I were there in person but someday, but I'm really honored as, and as we say in our Muskogee Creek language, Henje uh, Stongo, you know, good morning here is good afternoon there. And um, at least we can meet this way and that helps. But um, it's an honor to be here and, and to meet you, to meet all of you. It's been, I, we've had a great time even before we started. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. And it must be, I mean, you were made the American Poet Laureate in 2019, and it must have been an extraordinary journey, the journey of your life to, to that point um, of being the, the, the American Poet Laureate, the National Poet of America. How does that feel to you? It's still, yeah, it was shocking to me when it happened. And uh, I know that people were celebrating you know, when I did my my performance, I, I was the only poet to have a whole band and play saxophone at my inaugural <laughs> performance in DC. But people were, you know, tribal people, the different tribal nations were just celebrating big time because it's really unusual. And, and I was happy, you know, I'm a representative and I'm in service. I say all positions are service positions, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You're born. It's a service position. And I'm here to, you know, serve poetry. But it was really, it is kind of shocking if you look, if you know me or know my story, you know, to to wind up being the US Poet Laureate is quite a it's been quite a journey. Yeah, no, I, and I do know your story, and I, I, it is, and it is shocking. It is wonderful um, because it feels, in a sense, like it's probably the ultimate validation that a person could get in a way is to become your country's national poet. Um, and it's it's strange when you've suffered um, by your country uh, abuse, um, terrible treatment. Uh, racism and when your people have been treated so badly it, it's it's it then kind of makes you feel that you get to a certain age and it takes getting to that certain age and being made your country's national poet before you can feel like like you're properly of your country um whereas and that's strange because of course you were of your country all along before they came and took your country. So it's a very, very complex thing, but I know that from, from my own point of view, I, I was just adopted. And uh, and when I when I uh, read at the opening poem of Scottish Parliament, um, in Scottish Parliament, my mum my mom and dad that adopted me were there in the in the audience. Um, uh, my dad's just died recently, but um, he was there in the audience and he was really, really happy. I'm really excited, but I was also thinking it was in the town that I was born, Edinburgh, this town that we're virtually in right now. And I was also thinking that it would be an amazing thing for my birth mother to realise that that baby that she had in the mother and baby home in Edinburgh was, was now standing in front of the Queen. And it just seemed wild, I mean, really quite wild to me, <laughs> bizarre. And, uh, and it was just, uh, but it also felt extraordinarily validating um, extraordinarily validating and my, my dad said to me when I became the macker he said to me he was 91 and a half then and he said to me how long is your term in the office and I said it's five years dad and he said well your mother and I will just need to see out your term in the office and um, <laughs> he very much he, he very nearly did but um but anyway it, it is that strange thing of of, of feeling um, Suzanne and I both had this experience of always being stopped and asked where you're from, where you're from, where you're from, um, because, you know, we're, 
yeah, but, and people often mistake us for each other and all sorts of things. And, and so we've had a lifetime of strange, strange experiences. And and I finally feel now, I'm, I'm about to be 59, so I think I'm about 10 years younger than you, Joy, but I finally feel like I do belong to my country, but it's a bit of an extreme step. To, you can't really recommend it to everybody. Oh, just become your country's national poet. That'll sort you out. <laughs> yeah. No, history is complex and, and there's, you know, every human is a contra set of contradictions and paradox and a great irony, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it is, there, it is. And then um, my uh, tribal nation just had a landmark decision in the Supreme Court that backed up treaties, the treaties that said, you know, we, you know, these lands that we were moved to in Oklahoma we're still, you know, you know, they're still ours. Absolutely. That was but big. It was huge. Very, it was, it was a huge massive decision. Of course, immediately uh, people went about trying to, they're still trying to undo that, you know, but it was, it was a huge, it was a huge decision. And somehow it feels to me like this poet laureate thing, that was a mark. And then it, you know, there's just doors, doors opening, of course, behind the doors opening are people trying to close them again, but maybe that's the great, you know, that's the story making. The story yeah. wheel. Yeah, the story wheel, right? Yeah. The story wheel. So we have to continue. We can't just relax, you know, it was just like the next day we were having, the next day after that announcement, everybody was working to try to stop what they had already set into place. But it's shocking, it really does. shocking. Yeah. But did it feel, because you've you've won a number of honors uh, in your life, you know, a Guggenheim, a Josephine Miles Prize, all sorts of different awards. Your, work, your work's been garlanded with, with prizes and you've received a lot of, and rightly so, recognition for your work in the form of literary prizes, but did becoming your national poet the country's national poet feel different to those kind of awards? It's a very different kind of thing. And, and most of those awards came after just a few years ago. For years, mm -hmm. I didn't get much recognition. I got no national recognition, but I made a reputation on my poetry and traveling and reading and, and uh, performing and visiting people. And, and that's how, you know, I just garnered that reputation. And it wasn't until probably about 10 years ago, I, I had applied for Guggenheim many, many years. And I finally got one. I know people that applied and got it on the first time, mm -hmm. but I never got, I got turned down. But I always had a feeling I wouldn't get one in poetry. I got it in creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is interesting. You know, she had some horses as one of my most well-known books. It never got reviewed and uh, was never, noticed it was never got any recognition well i want to tell you that i noticed it <laughs> when it came out <laughs> and i had that's one of my favorite poetry books she has some horses um and it's you know i've been reading your work for for years and so that's why it makes me that's why i'm even more excited to to have you here because your voice um um was so important to me um, and you've been around a long time uh, and you've been making your work known for the people that were able to get into sister writer compendium or independent bookshops that, that stored it and um, were able to find your work and you know the work your work and the work of June Jordan and Audrey Lawrence um, meant a, a, a huge amount to me. I noticed that you begin um, American Sunrise with an epitaph, one of them from June Jordan, about the beauty of the truth and telling the truth. I met her on a number of occasions and Audrey, Audrey Lord. But it oh, seems to me... I was just writing something about Audrey, yeah. Were you? That's, that's wonderful. What, what's that for? It was something that I have due. <laughs> yeah, it's something I have due, but I was talking about her mentorship, of, you know, her mentorship. She mentored a lot of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was an incredibly generous person. I mean, my son, who will be 32 this Friday, she kind of get, I still find that really amazing, um, but he'll be 32 this Friday. Well, his little bank account that he's got was opened by Audrey Lord. Oh, really? Um, 
yeah, because she did a she did an interview with Spare Rib, and uh, oh. and they sent her a check for sixty pounds, not very much money, and they said, you know, you can donate this back to the magazine, and she said, what a nerve! I'm asking for their money back. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to what a cheek them got. I'm going to I'm going to. She said, I'm going to give it to you. And I was pregnant at the time with my son, so she said, put that in a bank and open that for your boy. So that's how we know. I didn't know I was having a boy for your child. So that was it. So it's, it's a great, it's a quite a cool story to to tell. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you come from uh, from a long line of poets and extraordinary poets have been poet laureates, poets whose work that I uh, really, really admire. Um, the, the Rita Doves of the world and the yeah. Robert Frost and the Robert Frost of the world. Um, and it's it's interesting to, to think of a kind of a lineage, if you like, a poetic lineage and where you fit into that. And do you think of yourself as, as fitting into a lineage are you interested that you've immediately followed say Tracy K Smith and and in the people that, that have come and um, before you does it feel that it relates to you in a way or not it does now it, it you know it's taking me I was just appointed a second term our terms are one year and um, for years I felt even though I feel felt very part very much a part of like the multi multicultural presence of poetry in America. I felt very much a part of that circle that included June Jordan and, you know, all, I was friends with everybody. We were all, you know, we all, you know, and we still do, you know, take Quincy Troop, a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. Ishmael Reed, all, you know, we, we have a kind of circle and then indigenous poets, native poets. Um, but I've always, with my poetry, I don't know, I've always followed my own voice. Mm. And it's never fit. I've never felt like I fit anywhere. I fit with my people, you know, sometimes and sometimes not, you know, how, how it is. But um, but I've always felt kind of a, like a loner. And it's not until now um, that I'm starting to see the kind of the larger, I think maybe every artist, maybe every poet feels that way in a sense that, you know, in, in, you know, and especially if you're not shoring up a, cla a classical tradition. I mean, I'm not shoring up a classical Muskogean tradition and we have classical traditions too, just like a lot of times you say classical music and it's Western, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Western European music is, con or, you know, it's, but, but we all have, there's classical music, there's classical poetry and I figure that people work either vertically or horizontally. Vertically, they, they take, they come directly out of this classical tradition of whatever culture or cultures. And then I work more horizontally so that I am, I take, I'm part of that. That's an essential part of me, but so is, um, like you said, Robert Frost or, you know, Audrey June and, you know, William, and, Blake, William Blake in your case as well. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You love you love William Blake, the mystic and the visionary because that's also um, central to to my poetry too. Because mm. I'm I'm fast fascinated reading your poetry with what a sense of, of family and ancestry uh, that you get and and hearing your story too um, of a time when you were in hospital. Uh, with suspected polio and the way that you describe that experience um, actually reminded me of being in hospital age three as well it was ex it's extraordinarily detailed that 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 memory remembering being a child and remembering what that's like and remembering what it's like to being abandoned and the way that you write about your mother in that way that you're kind of almost in love with your mother, like we are in love with our mothers. We notice everything about them. You recreate her, you re recreated her for me to such an extent that I feel like I, I know her. She feels like a familiar. And um, and it, it, it seemed to me that that, that whole uh, business of remembering at one point you say in your poems and in your memoir, that you're, you're, you're one of the last people in your generation. It's your business to remember. You have to remember. Yeah, that's true. There is no, you know, you get to you get to my age, I'm 69. And 
the people that you relied on, your mentors, the people who know things in the community, in the larger community, and even global, because we all it's a, we come we've come into a global world, and we know people all over the world. But um, you lose people. You know, it becomes. I was worried that my Facebook page at one point was just going to be a page of memorials <laughs> you know, because you lose people. And then now we're losing people to COVID. And, um, but you look around and there's only a few, a few of you, you know, I lose my, lost my mentors, but I find them. Sometimes I hear them, they're in their poetry, they're in their stories, or I've learned that nothing is ever really lost. And no one is lost. I, I was a grandmother in my 30s. I'm a great grandmother now. I became a great grandmother about four years ago. And um, I've watched this, you know, there's this ancestral thing. I talk about poetry ancestors, that every poem has ancestors. You know, there are, and you can start a whole class that way, just have everybody bring in a poem, and then you start tracking the ancestors of that poem and the poet. And you can make a whole class. You can make a whole class from that. So well, this seems yeah. this seems a good time to actually hear one of your poems. Would you would you like to do a reading for us? That would be fantastic. yeah. I'll read the poem "Running" now. If you're talking about family, and uh, this is one I usually hesitate to read, but. Um, I always tell tell audiences that too. A lot of people think that poets just, you know, your audience knows better, probably this audience. But I know in the public, I know in the American public, people think, well, poets just get an idea and write it down, and it's there, you know. And and it's it's not that way. And then some sometimes you get something and run with it, but there's a lot of revision, and we also study history. You know, we're always. Uh, you know, studying something. I'm always studying history and, and music and et cetera. But uh, so things get woven in. And I always say that uh, preface and say, well, not every poem is about me, even if it's an I. And yet in this poem, I don't know why I'm saying all of that because this, <laughs> did, this did particularly happen, but it really doesn't matter that it happened, but it does matter. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Absolutely. That makes sense if you're a poet and you follow it. It's called Running. It's closing time. Violence is my boyfriend with the cross to bear. Hoisted on by the church, he wears it everywhere. There are no female deities in the Trinity. I don't know how I'm going to get out of here, said the flying fish to the tree. Last call. We've had it with history. We who look for vision here in the Indian and poetry bars somewhere to the left of hell. Now I have to find my way when, when there's a river to cross and no boat to get me there, when there appears to be no home at all. My father gone, chased by the stepfather's gun. Get out of here. I found my father at the bar, his ghost at least, some piece of him in that sorry place. The boyfriend's convincing to a crowd. Right now, he's a spell of attraction. What tales he tells in the fog of thin hope. I wonder the sad world we've made with the enemy's words. The lights quiver like they do when the power's dwindling onto a dangling stream. It's time to go home. We are herded like cat stoned cattle, like children for the bombing drill. Out the door into the dark street of this old Indian town where there are no Indians anymore. I was afraid of the dark because then I could see everything, the truth with its eyes staring back at me, the mouth of the dark with its shiny moon teeth, no words, just a hiss and a snap. I could hear my heart hurting with my in the dark ears. I thought I could take it. Where is the party? It's been a century since we left home with the American soldiers at our backs. The party had long started up in the parking lot. He flew through the dark, broke my stride with a punch. I went down and came up. I thought I could take being a girl with her heart in her arms. I carried it for justice, for the rights of all Indians. We all had that cross to bear. 
These, those old ones followed me, the quiet girl with the long dark hair, the daughter of a warrior who wouldn't give up. I wasn't ready yet to fling free across. I ran and I ran through the 2 a.m. streets. It was my way of breaking free. I was anything but history. I was the wind. Yeah, that's wonderful, wonderful poem. And I like, I like the paradoxes that are in that poem as well. I was anything but history. I was the wind because you get a sense of living in that moment, in that present time, but you also get a sense that you are running with, with history, running mm -hmm. through history and running to tell the story. Um, running to to be to be free, running to escape, but also running towards. Um, yeah. Running is running itself is, is such an extraordinary thing because you're you're thinking in your head as you're running. It's a freeing thing, isn't it? Running, um, it's freeing in, in some ways, but it's also uh, because it's philosophical at its heart. And that poem reminds me of how philosophical running is, and how for some people running is a necessity. And what was physically running like for you? Well, I'm not really a runner per se, although I'm, I do a lot of dance workout and, uh, and uh, weights and so on. And the only sport that I ever really did was racing outrigger canoes in Hawaii <laughs> when I lived there. But <laughs> I would like to, I've always wished I could get to that runner's place because I have, I have done some for workout. It's just that what I would do at 2 a.m., you know, just because of that, at that moment, that violence, I just ran home through the dark. And I was thinking about how you growing up and so many times somebody looked after me because I was in places of great danger. You know, in that neighborhood, being alone, a young woman, you know, running through, running through the, running a mile home. Yeah, running to running to escape and running to to be safe. And you yeah. write in your work, you write in your work across the body of your work a lot in different ways about violence, all different kinds of violence, male violence, violence from within a community, and violence from without, um, violence inside and outside of the life, and and the way that violence can can uh, define a life. But you mm -hmm. also write about violence in a in a interesting way you know there's an extraordinary moment where you talk about your father having your your mother's head in a in a kind of lock and uh, when you were just a baby and and the and the way that you write about that is is in, interested me because it didn't feel uh it, it felt the sorrow from everybody's point of view of that violence of the person being violent as well as the person that's the victim of it. You seem to get the sorrow from everybody's point of view. Yeah, and actually in this new memoir that I am uh, just wrote called, it's going to be called Poet Warrior, A Call for Love and Justice. And some of those scenes, I mean, I, I, I take it from the last memoir, but I, in order to tell a life, I still go back to some of those places and, and my, uh, Reasoning for that is that you still, that's how memory works. And there's places in the territory of memory that are so resonant and deep that you're trying to work out that yes, you return to them. So I need to make a note because I have to, <laughs> I need to go in and write something in that memoir about that, about how, you know, there's this point, I go back to this point, you know, because you know, because it is so resonant and I don't, I have not fully, I don't know if you want to disappear it because those points become points of great knowledge. Mm. I know, I know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's interesting, it's brave as well because people's instinct um, when something traumatic's happened is to run from it or not to talk about it or to be silent about it. And that's individual people and whole nations to, to just as a nation not speak about something because the trauma has been too much, the trauma of, of our people in whichever way the trauma's happened to our people that, that happened in, in, in so many different ways. We could talk about that um, just, just for the entire hour, but also in a personal way, people seem to think that if you, talk about something that's traumatized you um 
that what happened years ago. That, oh no, you want to be, you want that to be gone. You want to, you want that to be away. And actually, to me, it seems like the very opposite is true. And to mm -hmm. me, to me, the strength is in returning to things that have deeply hurt you and returning differently to them. Because every time you return to the point of something that has hurt you deeply. Um, you, you get to a different point of arrival as well as a different point of departure. And it seems to me a, a kind of extraordinary um, strength to be able to face something and return to it. Uh, and that's what your work does. It comes around in circles and returns to things, but it returns to things and each time it returns, it sees something new and also gives you a different, a different ending. So in the poem, Washing My Mother's Body, it hurts you that you didn't get to wash your mother's body actually, but you return to that and you imagine it in such extraordinary detail. Um, and not just the washing of her body, but all the memories that come back and forth from the pail and the cloth and everything that it takes you back and forth childhood to. And, 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 and in doing that, you repair some of the hurt that it must have caused by not being there to wash your mother's dead body. Yeah, it was interesting how that poem happened because often I'm, you know, reading history and then start blending all kinds of things. And I was in a, I was working on American Sunrise, but I was in this, in another whole side of the family, <laughs> you know, following this particular trail and movement. And then I sit down and it's like the poem is like waiting to be written. It just came out. It just, I just kept writing and writing. Of course, I revise, I revise a lot. And I still, uh, I think I've revised since it's been printed <laughs> a little bit, because as I read, yeah. as really? I what, perform, have you <laughs> what, have you what have you changed then? Do you remember what you've changed in that? It's nothing big since the, no. since it's been printed, but there was a yeah. period I took out in the first version I sent to Norton, to my editor, I, it was a little bit longer and I cut it down. Mm. I but, think it's just a really, I, I find it just an absolutely, extraordinary poem and Suzanne and I were discussing it together um uh, you know it's a kind of well it's the kind of poem you want to talk about to your friends we, we were talking about it past midnight on the phone uh, the other night you know we were we were talking about it and we were talking about ancestry and this seems a good moment to bring in uh, the wonderful Suzanne Bonner my kind of sister friend um because uh, my beloved because um uh, yeah because um you know, we, we think, don't we, a lot about, about ancestry and about what's missing and about returning to points in order to make them, make them different. Yes, and Joyce, your work, oh my goodness, the resonance. I understand when you talk about loneliness because I think the loneliness of, um, for me, my dad was American from Cherokee County, uh, oh. Carolina. My mum's Scottish and I lived in a small, very small rural, like island life small community and I was probably like the only person the only me <laughs> so you know it was <laughs> it was a lot to work out and through hearing and engaging with your work there's just something a great power that you you bring you know you um you strengthen my own resolve when I engage and and listen in particular to your voice and your delivery of your work so it's very powerful you empower people greatly and say, just, women, <laughs> women, you know, and it's the pictures yeah. of your mum and when you talk about ancestors and what we bring through and we remember and that it's it's not being scared to, as Jackie has alluded to, to, to touch that source, that yeah. we, we carry the flames and it's actually what's beautiful about the, the customs and the way of the, the native tribal way is that we, we do that through dance and song and moon and memory and stomp and you know it's just incredibly freeing and powerful so thank you <laughs> Suzanne, Suzanne you, you you decided that you would sing a song that's that's been inspired um or even provoked by yes by, immer by immersing yourself in the wonderful joy heart and yes. um, what, could you tell could you tell us a little bit about the song that you've picked and uh, well it's, it's called and its, root, its roots yes it's a it's an old folk song and there's lots of different I think kind of um theories about how it evolves and when it was written it's called Shenandoah and um my dad also supposedly have Chinese uh, Cherokee ancestry and 
it reminded me of when I went to Carolina, you know, that you were talking about Scotland too, and the mountains, the spruce trees, the starlight, the rivers, and how indeed people were taken from land, uh, you know, along the Trail of Tears, people lost land and the longing for land and sacredness of land and, and all that we are. And there's a strong tradition in, in Scotland too, in Gaelic culture, you have people that sing, you know, of the land and loss and death and life and how that is celebrated. So Shenandoah, because it talks about a river and loss and longing and longing to see something and that great mystery, the great spirit of the mystery of life that we belong, you know, we belong, we're part of the earth. The earth doesn't belong to us. We are a part of it all. So here we go. <laughs> Shenandoah, my native valley, I love to hear the music of your rivers. Shenandoah. Across the wide Missouri, it's been seven long years since last I saw. It's been seven long years since last I saw thee. Away I am bound to go across the wide Missouri. Shenandoah, I long to hear you away, you rolling river, oh Shenandoah, I long to hear you. Away, I am bound to go across the wide Missouri. Hey. Hey, that is so beautiful. Now I know what they mean when people say they're transported. Ah, <laughs> beautiful. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> And Jackie too. <laughs> that was um. Yeah. That was that we was need really... to hear from Jackie now. Jackie, we need to hear a poem from you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, I was really moved by that, Suzanne, because of well, the, the combination of of reading the ways in which you talk about rivers, joy, and the rivers that run through our lives, and continuance and the ways in which the dead can still um, be with us seems to be something that is important to 
to all of us and um, the conversation, the open-ended conversation we have with our dead. So um, I thought I would read this, this, this poem uh, to you. My birth mother, who was born in the Highlands of, of Scotland, uh, died just when I became the, the national poet of Scotland. So she didn't really get to, to know about that. But, um, but I, I, I was able to, to be with her just shortly before uh, she died. Um, but not actually when she died. Anyway, that's all too complicated. <laughs> I need to, need to scrap that. <laughs> Help! Um, but I thought, I... <laughs> but I thought I'd, I'd read this poem, that I, a very short poem that I wrote for her. Um, in my memoir, Red Dust Road, she's called Elizabeth. Um, but I decided that in this poem, I would give her her real name, which was Margaret. And weirdly, my, my name, my, my adoptive name is Jacqueline Margaret Kay. So I've got my mother's name and my middle name just purely by accident because it's my adoptive mum's <laughs> mother's name. But the other weird thing is that my, the name on my original birth certificate was Joy. So I was called Joy for the first five months of my life. Wow. I was Joy <laughs> Ross. Um, so it's very, it's very funny. And my birth mother apparently called me Joy. Um, so that I would bring joy to my adoptive parents. So I think it's funny to be to have been, uh, you know, called after an abstract noun in order to give joy to somebody. Just as well, it wasn't patience, hope, or charity. Well, and definitely my, not chastity. Yeah, <laughs> my that's funny. My sister's name is Margaret. Really? Yeah. There you go. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> joys, 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 and, joys and Margaret. But, but um, anyway, I wrote this poem and I did read it at my mother's funeral, but at my mother's funeral, uh, they asked me to come and read a poem and they introduced me as the National Poet of Scotland, but they didn't tell anybody that I was her daughter. And so that was a very strange experience and I kind of was annoyed at myself for uh, going through that with that. But anyway, and um, that's, that's what I did. And so this is um, Margaret's Moon. After she died, I swear the sky had the most beautiful of all sunsets, a blush of pink, then red, a glass of red, sudden dark, and a hammock moon, then its faint silhouette, almost secret, life half written, half unsaid. I'd kissed your head in a strange room, then later I blew a kiss to the stars to regret, Margaret. I imagined you lifting your head, your arms, loosening them, shedding skin, and cells and bone, till you became all spirit, released into the cairns, hills, braes, barley, the sea lochs and the sea. And at last, at least it seemed to me, you were free. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is, that's really beautiful. And so it's like the, our two poems are hanging out together, washing my mother's body and your poem. You know, this beautiful poem. I love all the Thank assonance, you. the assonance in it. And it's just regret, Margaret. Yes. <laughs> <For> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was thinking that, that that she had regret built into her name. Um, yeah. Um, but it's 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 interesting the business of secrets. Um, because I was thinking, you know, when um, I met her wonderful uh, husband, birth, uh, her husband, who didn't, who hadn't known of me, he, he was just very moved to find out about me. And he said to me, I don't feel sorry for you. I don't feel sorry for myself. The person I feel sorry for is Margaret, the pressure cooker. The woman must have been under the pressure cooker, and he kept re repeating this expression to me: the pressure cooker. And um, and the, and I and I realised that secrets, you know, secrets are time bombs. They go off at some point or another, and um, nobody it's knows like, when. Uh -huh. Nobody knows when the secret will go off. But it, it seemed to me such an incredible waste that he would have actually been fine all along, and that she needn't have put herself through the burden of this of this secret that was me. Um, and so secrets are strange, and they, they connect all of our lives as well. I mean, we've got so much still to to talk about. But what do you first think about Joy when you think about secrets to tell people? 
maybe what I don't tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think about it, but I also think historically, because I was still thinking back to earlier about how history, you know, how memory and, and, you know, we were natives in this country have been, there's, you know, there were efforts to wipe us out of memory, even the memory. And there still are by some state governments who are very right wing, who are rewriting history to exclude us or to exclude anyone who is not of European, you know, not of European look or blood. Yeah, I mean, because I was I'm really shocked to think that in 1978, which is fairly recently, it was still illegal to tell stories. The story itself was illegal um, was, for your yeah. your. And, and I just, I just think, you know, if you look at the history of when it was le legal to read or write for African Americans and for different communities who had the power to read and write, who had the power to pass stories, but when you look at actually the deliberate obliteration of culture, you see just how powerful a thing culture is, and that they need to squash it. The story is so powerful that it has to be banned in some way. And it's it's interesting to me that we have a similar situation with Gaelic culture in the Gaelic, you know, being the, the indigenous land of, of Scotland as a language was, was nearly pra practically wiped out. I mean, we're, we're working very hard in Scotland to get mm -hmm. the, the language back to the children and the traditions back. To the, children, to the children, but if you look at the Highland clearances and the forced removal of people from their houses, the burning of them in their houses, it's it's a really shocking, shocking history. But I, I'm, I was fascinated because in the conversation that Suzanne and I had very late last night, <laughs> like five in the morning, we were, we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I'm slightly hysterical at the moment because I've had about three hours of sleep. But, um, but, um, but, um, but we were having this conversation and Suzanne was saying to me that she heard, uh, listening to, to songs, well you should say it Suzanne, about the, about, about the conversation between the song cultures. Yes, yeah, some of the rise and fall and the like, are you on Gaelic? It's similar-ish, isn't it, to some of the, the native songs, you know, the traditional songs? I was yes, a similarity. There, there's a guy named <laughs> Willie, what is his name? He's a scholar who's done a lot of study of that. Yes, but, yes. Yeah, I know Max. Really know Max. Uh, yeah, no, not, not him. Oh, wait, no, another, another one. Yeah, I think yeah. he did about... Um, the, it's like the we free the mm -hmm. ah, ah, so the presenting of the soul being similar to gospel as well that, that he, yeah, he reckoned gospel. that slaves heard um you know and when they were working and that how it's influenced the sound of gospel you know in the, in the southern states how it evolved and um, from america i think i know who you mean joy Muskogee yeah. Creek, the people if you hear our music you hear that part of the roots of blues and jazz has been left out. Yes, and yes. In our traditional music, we're not powwow. Uh -huh. well, no, do pow -wow, but you can hear it. If I could, I would pull it up and play some right now. If I know. Yes. But in our traditional yeah. music, you hear the root, one of the roots of blues and yes. jazz. And our music has all these elements, similar elements. We have swing, we have polyrhythm, we've got. Uh -huh. you know, yes. Well, there's been, you know, tr you can't you can't straightjacket music. No, I know because you you write in your in your one of your poems, and I was there when jazz was born. Uh huh. And um, I love the the notion of that. I mean, I'm, I've written a book about uh, the great blues singer Bessie Smith. Yeah. Um, which should be coming out in February. But um, but I oh. I I'm really fascinated by the idea that the blues, the narratives of the blues, for instance. There was no story that couldn't be told in a blues song, and you write about that, Joy, too, about about being able to tell every story and how frustrating it is now that love songs are, you know, about leaving and being brokenhearted. But actually, at one point, at one point in our cultures, there there was the idea that the song could be big enough to to tell any story, to tell the story of of, of violence, to tell the story of forced exile, to tell the story of death and and rebirth and all of these different stories. Um, so it's fascinating to even think about the song and the, this journey and the narrowing of the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and poems are like that too. I mean, a poem is, I think of poetry as song language. 
and uh, not, and there's all kinds of poetry, but the poetry I write, I always consider, I always hear the music and um, yeah, there was something else I was gonna say. <laughs> it's early you, here. <laughs> you were going to say that if you'd known you would have brought uh, something along to be able to play it to us, what, what is it you would have brought along? Oh, to play to you, I, I play sax. I've been learning bass during the pandemic. Oh. I've mm -hmm. got uh, a big, I went and bought a uh, stand-up, not a, a stand-up, an electrical stand-up bass. <laughs> and then I have a small one and so I've been learning that. I just went in into the studio and recorded the foundation tracks for a new CD of music. Wow. But all that to say is that you, there's so much. I think that's what really engaged me when I started writing poetry is that you could just take something as simple as your voice and and pen and paper and it could hold it could hold a whole country. Ah. It could hold, hold a whole history. It could hold a moment where nothing else you know you could use poetry was a way of using words that could hold wordlessness places yes. of wordlessness yeah and poetry is, is a way that kind of can hold the the pain i mean you you write about a lot of very very difficult experiences um that you that you and your people have been through and i was wondering about that too the idea of being a representative voice I mean, when, when we began this, this conversation, you were talking about the excitement um, when it was announced that you were made the Poet Laureate because that's not just an experience for you, that's for all your people. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's, an extraordinary, that's an extraordinary thing. But to, is, is, there, is there any kind of drawbacks with that, do you find, being a representative voice? Oh, yes. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been put in the place of being a representative voice since I started, <laughs> you know, like the token. <laughs> You're going to represent all anybody who's not, you know, I've, and I, I always say, no, 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 I can't even, I'm not even official ambassador of my, my tribal nation. So I can't say I represent them, but I am a tribal citizen. And, um, but no, and even with poetry, you know, we're all different and I don't see myself, um, I'm just representing my own little area of <laughs> my own small area, but in this position, I am representative, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like the poetry ambassador is how I see it. Yeah. On behalf of poetry and the place poetry plays in our communities, all communities, you know, even communities I don't understand, you know, it's, it has a place. Yeah. yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I, I think, I, I think of myself being a poet as being an essential worker these days. Yeah. And we talk, we talk about essential workers being sort of nurses, doctors, supermarket people and all sorts. But I think in this particular time, um, we've had a real sense of how much poetry, culture, song matters to people and just, mm -hmm. just how much it matters in these times. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna call myself an essential worker now. I'm gonna get myself <laughs> some scrubs. <laughs> 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 and, and, and uh, Suzanne, Suzanne actually was, uh, I mean, she's, she's a trained nurse, um, so you, you actually were an essential worker in both ways, you're an essential worker as a singer, and you've been an essential worker as a nurse, and I was a hospital porter, but I'm, I'm kind of, and had all sorts of other jobs, but I'm kind of fascinated uh, in life at the idea of all of these different routes that you take two things and mm -hmm. they'll make you they make you who you are I mean I'm also a chancellor of a university so I have to stand up and and wear my gowns and, and they're all different roles um they're all different roles in life and which one of them is essentially to use the word essential again is essentially me and I think well actually you know they're probably just all me I mean do you feel more like yourself when you're a nurse Suzanne or more like yourself when you're singing I think they're all me and I think the interesting thing is that I worked in cardiology so it took me a while to, to for the penny to drop ah I'm working with the heart so you know it's um, there's so much fragility around about that there's so much robustness the heart as an organ does all that it can to keep you alive it's an incredible organ you'll see it does its own mini bypass do you know to keep you alive and um, people get lots of life-changing diagnosis and you're with people as they pass so um, I think the thing that has been the greatest privilege and it's a great leveler because it brings you to your truth and back to what you were both saying earlier about be your truth. So you can be with people in such a humble 
and truthful way, which is is just incredible. So I think, um, and I try and bring that to all that I do. And um, it's quite nice also to be anonymous when you go in to, to be with people and that they are the important ones. And it's lovely to, to you know, to, to carry that grace. But um, I think it's important that it's the centre of who you are, your truth, and that you bring it across. And that as artists, that we're allowed to be many things too, isn't it? That we, we, we often, probably the three of us, will have been pigeonholed by our identity. But it's something that also brings great freedom, um, the interconnectedness and the humane element to how we've had to evolve, look at our lives. And how that yeah. can indeed inspire others. Yeah. Yeah. And and in the 70s, I remember in the 70s and the 80s, people always used to ask you to choose, you know, is being black more important to you than being Scottish? Is being Scottish more important to you than being a lesbian? As if there was some sort of kind of uh, um, identity arithmetic going on. And I actually thought, you know, actually, I remember it was Audrey Lord that said to me, um, you know, Jackie, you can be black and and Scottish <laughs> you don't have <laughs> she said you don't have to choose and um, and she said that I was only in my 20s then but it was an extraordinary it's one of those life-changing things you don't have to choose and I decided actually no I, I really don't have to choose I can be black Scottish <laughs> and a lesbian and I don't have to choose but I remember you know um it, it, that and that also feels like a changing a, a changing times it feels very very different and um, being a lesbian now than it did for being being one at 17 and, and so on but it's it's interesting because I remember doing an interview uh, years ago and saying to this woman that I was sick of, of interviews with me, always pigeonholing me and saying black Scottish lesbian because white Scottish heterosexuals don't get that all the time, every time they're interviewed. Mm -hmm. And that I was kind of tired of it. Anyway, the interview came out and it had, that was the title of the interview in the Sunday paper, black Scottish lesbian. So she, she'd just done it again. Oh. And, um, <laughs> but, but then, but my gran, um, who's, who died years ago, my mother's mum, who lived to be 91 and a half too, she, she hadn't realised that I was a lesbian. I don't know why, because I'd had successive girlfriends around her house for gingerbread. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so she phoned up my mum and said, and said, does our father Ken about this? Which Ken is an old Scottish word for no. Does her father know about this? And um, and my mum said yes. And she said, "Well, there's one thing: no many people read that big paper because <laughs> it was it was a broadsheet." Um, but anyway, it was, uh, it was it was funny. It made me think. You know, people are always asking you, asking us to choose, and we are actually we are multiple. Oh, we are multiple. We are many. We speak in many tongues, and we represent, if you like many people and we represent the many people of ourselves it's been really a fantastic um hour and nearly an hour and to spend in in your fine company joy harjo and in your fine company suzanne bonner it's oh. been an absolute pleasure and delight and i'm wondering if just to finish uh, this splendid time and um, just before i make the finishing announcements um if you could just read us a, a parting poem joy yes i have a short one here and uh I'll read it. And then I just wanted to show something. It'll probably come out backwards, but this just came out from Norton. It's an anthology, the first Norton anthology of like native poetry called- I read that that was happening. I can't wait to of, get it. Yeah. Yeah, when the light of the world, I don't know if you can see uh, it on here. No, because of my no, back. No. Oh yeah, no, just yeah. a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. Uh, oh. Norton of native nations poetry yeah, yeah i saw that that was coming out and i thought that's going to be a book that i'm going to have to yes. have to get and norton are norton are extraordinary publishers aren't they over the yes, years they they've, are. Been, they've been amazing they have been with me i've had my same editor jill bialoski and i was turned down twice by norton i sent them really? she had some horses and I, that really? was turned down i sent them uh in mad love and war that was turned down and then I sent uh, the woman who fell from, from the sky. And finally, I went back. Three, I didn't give up. I went back. Now they publish you. horses. Yeah, now, yeah. They, 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 now they also publish horses. But I, I'll end with this poem called This Morning I Pray for My Enemies. It's from Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. So, 
And whom do I call my enemy? An enemy must be worthy of engagement. I turn in the direction of the sun and keep walking. It's the heart that asks the question, not my furious mind. The heart is the smaller cousin of the sun. It sees and knows everything. It hears the gnashing even as it hears the blessing. The door to the mind should only open from the heart. An enemy who gets in risks the danger of becoming a friend. Yeah. That was, that was wonderful, really fantastic. It's really been such a pleasure meeting you virtually in the, in the Zoom room. Um, really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much um, for being with us uh, today in Edinburgh. Um, I'm looking forward to welcoming you, having a wee dram with you somewhere uh, in the streets of Edinburgh sometime when we're able to, to do that in Rose Street, which is the street that, uh, that the poets used to hang out in, Hugh McDermott, Norman McCaig, they'd have a wee whiskey in Rose Street. So when we can do that, that's what I'll do, Joy Harjo. I'll take you down Rose Street and I'll buy you, I'll, I'll buy you a dram. <laughs> or two, and, and I, as they say. <laughs> and and, and I, great, I greatly, greatly look forward to that. But for now, thank you so much for, uh, to you at home for joining us. I hope you've laughed as much as we've laughed. I yeah, hope you've I've really enjoyed, enjoyed this. Yeah, I really hope like you have yeah, it feels like home being with you. And thank you so uh, much for bringing me into this uh, International Book Festival here with you. And um, thank you, Mado. Oh, thank you. And it just remains for me to, to say that if you want to get a hold of some of the wonderful, oops, is that round or wrong? Oh, I'm trying to move nope, it around. Yeah. It, yeah. Is that way? Is that right? I think. Yeah. I think <laughs> If you, this is this is really fantastic. This book, you, you absolutely have to get it. It's beautifully produced. It's beautifully written, and there's so many so many words of wisdom in there. There's ways that you can you can live your life by this book. It'll give you so much advice apart from anything else, but it'll also fill your heart and fill your spirit and make you think backwards and forwards through time, which is what the wonderful writer Joy Harjo does um, in all of her work. You must get hold of her work. You must get hold of her memoir and her other books. My, you know that it's, um, well, she's, she's, she's just a writer who's been around for a long time and you must find everything she's written and get it. And you can get it if you go on to the Edinburgh International Book Festival website, which is, let me just see, I wrote it down. Yes, which is a little moment of hesitation at Bookshop, bookshop at shop.edbookfest.co.uk. So that's bookshop at shop.edbookfest.co.uk. You'll be able to get all Joy's work there and peruse it and come back and see us sometime if you want to talk about it. We'll have a Joy Harshaw appreciation event next year. <laughs> 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 when, we'll all, when we'll all be there in person <laughs> see that, that poem see that poem hen what did you mean by it <laughs> thanks very much to Suzanne Bonner Joy Harshaw I'm Jackie Kay thanks for joining us I think we're all going to wave on the count of three in that okay. new zoom thing one two, two. three <laughs>